Well, folks, the CRA tax court rules against a tenant for $43,000 because the landlord is a non-resident. In Ontario, housing prices drop year over year. And why are young people so pissed? Let's talk about this crazy story about the uh, CRA tax court, this is Canada's tax court system. They ruled in favor of charging a tenant $43,000 because the landlord uh, was a non-resident and they couldn't collect the non-resident taxes that were due from the landlord, so they went to the tenant. This is a tenant that was in Montreal. The court did uh, have some sympathy and didn't charge the interest cost as well as uh, any other fees associated beyond what was due. But the reality is they did have to pay $43,000. Now, why is this? If a landlord is a non-resident, there should be a non-resident tax of 25% of whatever rent is due withheld and remitted to CRA on behalf of the landlord. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but the reality is the rent is deemed a royalty or a payment of such. And because of that, it is incumbent on the tenant to hold this non-resident uh, tax back from the payment. So if you owe $2,000 a month, $500 should have been withheld and remitted to uh, CRA. Now, how do you know if your landlord's a non-resident? Now, this is from a tax perspective, not a residential perspective. So there's, there are people that live abroad, but still file their taxes here and all that. But it is now proven that this court ruling, this tax court ruling, has clearly illustrated that it's the onus on the tenant to make sure that the landlord is a resident. How's that going to happen? You know, Will a tenant demand that I find out how you file your taxes and you are a resident? Every landlord is going to tell you to go fly a kite. But the reality is the onus is on the tenant. How do you get around this? Ask if your landlord is a, a, a resident. Maybe they could sign a statutory declaration that they are and that could be deemed sufficient. But then again, after you've signed your lease, they could move out afterwards and you wouldn't know. But it's really important that you do understand where your landlord is. Some of the things that could prevent this is dealing with a property management company that makes sure that the landlord is a non-resident and if, uh, is a resident. If not, they're going to withhold that non-resident tax on behalf of the landlord because they need to submit uh, that uh, tax, non-residence tax to CRA on behalf of the landlord. Uh, so, you know, this is an interesting tale because it's so odd that a tenant would get uh, stuck in this position. You know, you don't want to be uh, discriminated against if you start asking too many questions because it, the, the uh, vacancy rate is so tight that, you know, if you start asking these questions, a, tenant, a landlord is going to say, well, I'm not going to rent it to you because not many people know about this. But maybe what you do is you sign the lease and then a month in say, hey, I need to make sure that you are a resident because uh, if you're not, I have to withhold 25% and I'm going to remit on your behalf and then the landlord will say, okay, well, let me prove to you that I am a resident and then, you know, you get sorted out that way. But I think it's really important that people are aware of what can go wrong because this is a, a surprise and getting hit with a $43,000 bill uh, by CRA is not fun and then it'll stay on your record. They're going to chase you down for this cash. It's just a shit show. Make sure you deal with reputable landlords. Make sure that you know you, you look out for property managed uh, properties um, and, and try to make sure you don't get into a mess like this. CRA is obviously out to collect revenue. The government needs as much revenue as possible collected, so they're going to enforce. So be aware and understand what position you could be in if your landlord is a non-resident. Housing prices in uh, Ontario have dropped year over year. Sales are up 6.8%. Li new listings are up 29.7%. And active listings are up 24.8% year over year. Uh, prices, though, are down 0.07% in Ontario. 
Construction is down 2.6% quarter over quarter, and in the same uh, quarterly period, population went up 3.5%. So when you think of that, that's a huge variance. Construction is down 2.6%, population is up 3.5% in 90 days, a quarter. Very, very concerning. The amount of construction of new homes, low rise in particular, is down considerably. Any indication that this federal government is going to build 3.9 million homes by 2031 is a dream. It is a pipe dream. They're on major drugs. It's not going to fucking happen. So anybody that's, that's anticipating new homes being built anytime soon, Look at this stat, construction is down 2.6% while this government pounds the payment telling you that they're gonna build new homes. Now, what people need to realize is that the same government who fucked up the immigration file has gone out and told you they're gonna fix the housing problem. Think of how insane that is, folks. Like, this is lie after lie after lie. It's not gonna happen, so please, don't believe it. It's not going to happen. And that takes me to the third point, right? Why are young people pissed? The budget came out last week. It was a bunch of goodies to, to bring about fairness for young folks, and it didn't resonate. They're not listening. They're, they're, they have toned out, tuned out the federal government. Whatever they say is not, is not going to resonate with young people, okay? They are hurting, and here are some stats to prove it. Change in household net worth for 44 and under has gone down, okay, in uh, the last few quarters. Everybody over 45, it went up, okay. Uh, change in disposable income. Under 35 was the only group that went down. Everybody over 35, disposable income went up, okay. Uh, labor market is softening for young folks. Unemployment for folks 20 to 24 went from 7.9% to 10.5%. Okay? They're not getting the same opportunities. And they're turning away from the Trudeau propaganda in waves. Okay? It, it is becoming a major problem. And folks with uh, mortgages mortgage payments are outpacing income by 11 percent discretionary income is taking a pounding okay so we're seeing folks start feeling the pinch of these renewing mortgages and to put things into perspective anybody with a mortgage over 850 grand is feeling the most pain and the delinquency rate has gone up threefold off of the 2022 numbers for mortgages over 850 grand. In our industry, we talk about the five-year gap. This is people coming out of a five-year fixed rate and going into a new five-year fixed rate. And what is happening is there's a model that uh, Ben Robodeau uses in, in uh, his, his analysis, and it's called the five-year gap the five-year rate gap. And it is a number that applies to the amount of increase per $100,000 people should anticipate coming out of a five-year fixed and going into another five-year fixed. And right now that gap is $111, the highest it's ever been. So what that means is for every $100,000 in mortgage that you're carrying, you're gonna see a $111 increase to your monthly payment by staying on that same amortization schedule and seeing that bump and increase. So if you have a $500,000 mortgage, your payment is gonna go up $555 per month. Okay, that's just over $6,600 per year in disposable income that's being taken out of your, your, your budget. If you have a million dollar mortgage, your payment's gonna go up $1,100 $10 a month. So we're starting to see people uh, get squeezed with these renewals. More and more people are coming up for renewals and it's starting to take shape. As I mentioned before, things are starting to break. Things are really 
going to uh, start uh, putting a, a bit of pressure on people's spending habits, disposable income. We're seeing more and more people run out of money before they run out of month. They're looking to refinance, they're looking for solutions. And we're meeting with people on a daily basis, working through a few different options for them to consider. So if you know anybody that's looking for some help, please feel free to give us a call. We're, we're here to help you out. We're here to try to uh, ease the pain and get you into something that's more um, digestible and, and something you could swallow. So please reach out. We're happy to help. We've got a great team here, and uh, I'm just a, a DM and phone call away. The other thing I, I'd like to just touch upon, we're going to change the format a little bit. Um, the podcast is doing quite well. I want to uh, turn the weekly Instagram show into a more uh, question and answer. So we're going to uh, slowly move the uh, Instagram show into a Q&A. So um, that way we got, could have a little bit more engagement and, and help uh, folks out that need the immediate attention and have a question to ask uh, right away so we could get you some answers uh, more immediately. It seems like people are, are, are busting at the seams and, and hoping to get something answered. They're a little bit reluctant to reach out uh, sometimes. So if you do have a question, please ask. We'll be happy to help. Um, that leads us into the Q&A. Tighten up the chin strap, put on the helmet. Let's get right into it. What is the solution for first-time home buyers to qualify for a mortgage today? Listen, the first-time buyers are really taking it um, on the chin. You know, back in 2018, 2019, the first-time home buyer was uh, CMHC was seeing a, a huge number of applications. It's now dwindled down to almost nothing. Okay, people are just having a tough time qualifying. What first-time home buyers are doing is they're taking advantage of additional applicants on the file, parents, guardians, co-signers, to help them qualify for the mortgage. These folks have to go on title in a lot of cases and um, are, are basically needing that income to qualify with the higher rates and the stress test. The qualifying rate, as we have all know, is two percentage points above the contract rate. So folks need to qualify for a higher level mortgage payment and they're doing so by um, getting co-signers or getting gifts that are starting to creep up in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that qualify for a lower mortgage from parents, grandparents and the like. So that's what's happening, that's what we're seeing and it's becoming quite prevalent. What income is required to qualify for a $500,000 mortgage today? Usually people qualify for three and a half to four times their income, okay? Provided they don't have a lot of debt load, provided it's a conventional property tax uh, rate and you know condo fees are in order uh, and not too excessive. So three and a half to four times is the, is the rule of thumb. So in this particular case, a $500,000 mortgage would probably need about 135 to 140 $345,000 in income to qualify. What should I consider for the renewal, fixed or variable? What I do recommend in the interim is to pound down your debt. If you have the ability to make accelerated payments, lump sum payments, do so, so you owe less at renewal. Now, as far as what you should consider at renewal, you have time. You know, we'll see if the Bank of Canada uh, does make any moves. You know, we were anticipating drops in January, didn't happen. Then we had anticipated, you know, the, all these economists thought it was going to happen in April, didn't happen. Now they're calling for June. Who knows? Okay. I was of the opinion that we're going to be closer to 5% on the Bank of Canada overnight rate than 4% at the end of the year. And I'm looking pretty good, not to toot my horn, because I hope they come down and I hope I'm wrong. But the reality is things have to break and the market has to start seeing some pain. And unfortunately, it's going to be bad news on the unemployment front that's going to drive the Bank of Canada to uh, start moving on rates. And we're still seeing inflation to be sticky. This budget that took place uh, that was announced most likely going to get passed with the NDP is probably going to see another uh, flurry of spending which isn't good news to the Bank of Canada because they're hoping, hoping that um, you know, the, the government was going to tighten their belt, but they're going on, on another spending spree. So I don't know if the Bank of Canada is going to be dropping anytime soon. 
What does crown priority mean? There's a good one. Crown priority is when the government imposes or, or, or uh, gets judgment against someone for uh, non-payment of crown money. Now, what is crown money? Anytime an employer or a self-employed person or someone who doesn't pay their taxes, okay, and this is usually taxes that belong to the crown, HST, employee remittances, so CPP contributions, EI contributions, income taxes that were deducted from an employee. Anytime an employer or a self-employed person does not remit those fees that belong to the government or even property taxes, okay? Very rarely does, do you see it because municipalities are very lenient in this, in this situation where I think they might start tightening up, but let's talk about federal funds. So EI contributions, CPP contributions, uh, federal income taxes deducted from source and HST, if you do not remit those payments, the government will come after you hard and they will put security, which is crown priority, in first position on those on your property. So what that means is if I have a first mortgage and I have a second mortgage, let's say, and I don't pay my crown taxes, the government can put a charge on my home that bumps a mortgage out of first position and takes priority on that home. Okay, and if something happens, they are the first ones to get paid. And there have been cases where people who've owed HST and sold their home and those, do, those amounts were due prior to that home being sold, CRA has gone after the lender because they paid out the, their mortgage before finding out if any crown money was owed by that self-employed person and they've won cases against lenders that have been paid out and they should have not paid it and those funds should have gone to the crown. There's a case between the crown and TD Bank back in uh, I think 2015-2016 where this took place and it put everybody on alert in the private space because and lending space because now they want to make sure GST and HST payments are up to date by people that are self-employed so they don't run into this type of scenario. Good question, very rare, but that's a really good point. What does the capital gain inclusion rate going from 50 to 66.7 mean? This is a good question and it seems like a lot of people are a little bit confused about this whole capital gain um, increase that uh, was bandied about in the budget. So the inclusion rate, what does that mean? The inclusion rate is the amount of the gain that is taxable. So with the budget, they have increased the capital gains inclusion rate from 50% to two thirds, okay, which is 66.666. If you had a $100,000 gain, okay, the inclusion rate would mean that you would only be taxed at 50% of that gain. Okay, you've taken the risk, you put your money out there for a capital gain, and you've made a $100,000 profit. Only 50% of that gain is taxable at your tax rate. That's the inclusion rate. It's no longer going to be 50% as of June 25th. It will be two thirds. So you will be taxed an additional $16,666 of that $100,000 gain if you have a personal gain above $250,000, because the increase only applies on the amounts over, over $250,000 personally, but corporately, if you're holding it in a corporation, there's no $250,000 uh, uh, change, okay? So it's on the full amount. So hopefully that's clear. A lot of people aren't necessarily aware of this and it really only applies to people that have large investments in corps where they're going to see the full inclusion rate on the full gain. If your personal, if it involves a personal uh, matter, 
then you still have the, 200, the first 250,000 where the capital gain is 50%. Everything above that's going to be two thirds. Hopefully that answers it. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, really appreciate it. Please tune in to the podcast on Monday. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe. I'm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the YouTube channel, Owl Mortgage. Love to uh, have you on there. Comment, tell me what you think about it. I'd really appreciate it. In the meantime, we'll see you next week. Take care.